Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar Culture and Compass, Cultivating a Successful Environment for Employees and Clients. I'm Manuel Palachuk, Entrepreneur and Business Coach, and I'll be your host and speaker for this presentation. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you are. As always, I see from the registration that we do have people from all over the world sitting in today. Once again, I'm presenting on a subject that I'm very passionate about. As always, I believe it's of vital importance to your business and of critical importance to our industry. I do believe I have some great content prepared for you, but this time I'm doing a few things different. The slides are not overstuffed with bullet items for you to read and study. I've done this intentionally because this presentation is not about statistics or numbers. I want you to be able to sit back and listen and take it all in without having to focus on bullet points. Believe me, you're still in for an information packed session. As always, I like to start things off by finding out where in the world some of you folks are from. So Go ahead and just type in who you are and where you're from. Okay, we've got uh, Jeffrey from Pensacola, Florida, Dennis, Palm Beach Gardens, Matthew from Earth, good, Benjamin, Gold Coast, Australia, awesome, I would love to go sailing in Australia, that would be fantastic. Lewis uh, in his living room, John in Kansas, Mark in Salem, Oregon, Gatwick, England, Simon, Raj, Portland, Oregon, Mark, Coffs Harbor, Australia, excellent, Kamloops, BC, Go Kamloops Blazers, Sean in Virginia, Rick, Appleton, Wisconsin, Martin in Greenland. All right then, once again, I will say it's an honor and a privilege to be presenting for you today, so let's get started. Those who have listened in on any of my recent webinars already know that I'm gonna skip over the intro and such, but for those who are listening in for the first time, here's how it works. I'm going to skip all the regular reminders, history, biography, and credentials so that we can speed things up and spend more time on content and follow up questions. I believe you've all been on a lot of webinars, and if you're interested in who the speaker is, you can just Google them or hit their website, and I'm no different. I also usually ask if it's okay for me to skip over the extras, but this time I'm just going to do it. We are going to get straight into the good stuff, but I do have three mandatory items. Number one, there's nothing for sale at all on this training. No lead up, no sales pitch, no big call to action. You've all been on a call where it's half sales and half content or even less. I do have two pages of resources listed on the slides at the end, but I'm here to give you a lot of great content and no big sales pitch. So please, don't feel like you need to drop off early or avoid the big pitch and call to action at the end. Stay for the Q&A. Number two, please do yourself a favor and block out all distractions. I'm going to be discussing some of the best strategy I know of for business success, and if you can focus on it without distraction and soak in all that I present, I believe it really could help you and your team and your business get to the next level. Now this is the last item and it's going to be a little bit different. I'm recording this presentation and I have much more content than can be covered in 45 to 50 minute session and it's going to be broken into two part webinar. If you notice this, the session is actually scheduled for one hour and 15 minutes but I will be here as long as is needed to cover the content completely. The intention is that I finish it in a reasonable time frame and we have a little Q&A session follow up. Please understand that my main goal is to get all of the information out to you and not skim over anything. If you do not want to or cannot stay for the Q&A, please post your questions as the presentation proceeds because I will either answer in the session or in the follow-up email. This webinar has been broken into two presentations. The first one, this one, Culture and Compass, Cultivating a Successful Environment for Your Employees and Your Clients, and a second one, Defining Your Business Identity, Mission, Vision, and Values. Each of these presentations is complete in itself, but I highly recommend that you treat them as companion presentations and watch them together in order, first culture and compass, and then defining your business identity to get the most out of them. Okay, so we're going to skip that slide, and that one, and that one, and that brings us to the intro. I want to speak about culture and compass for two reasons. First, I believe both are extremely important components of any company's business strategy and their social software. Second. I constantly come across companies who have been around for years, but are sorely lacking both a set culture and a fixable compass. What is important is not that they still manage to thrive most years or stay in business in spite of these missing critical components, but that it may be these two most important components that are actually keeping them from getting to the next level. Somehow, 
In recent years, the culture and compass of too many companies are overlooked or just neglected by those responsible for their care. One of the largest contributors to this phenomenon is the natural formation of a, a small company. Someone goes out on their own, starts a company, and the last thing on their mind is human resources or social software or mission or vision. The next thing you know, one person shop grows to two, then five, and on. One day you have a company that's 25, 50 people, or more, and there is still no set culture and there is no fixable compass, or the compass is just broken. Another unfortunate contributor is the mindset of relentless drive for profit above the drive for value, the consideration for human interaction, or even on a larger scale, the concern for the world beyond our own doorstep. I'm always talking about how if you're in the MSP or IT service business, you have in fact chosen a business in one of the most demanding and most competitive industries in today's economy. I'm always pushing on the fact that this means that just for you to stay in business, you have to constantly be marketing and innovating to keep up. And if you actually want to thrive and get ahead, you have to create a competitive advantage. I will tell you this, no really big company ever got big without a mission and vision and value statement. And if their culture and compass were not set or cared for, they are either not very respected in the, in the industry today or they are not in the industry today. Look at any company you know of, regardless of size, and tell me if you can see the culture of their business. Can you see their compass heading? Where does it point? Who comes first, the business or the customer, the profit or the reputation? Think of BP Oil, Virgin America, Amazon, Enron, Monsanto, Microsoft today, Microsoft from 20 years ago, Google, Walmart, your cable company, your local dry cleaner, grocer, or service station. These companies are in your life every day and they are all vying for your business. Do you care which you do business with? Do you even have a choice? Most small companies pride themselves on their integrity and their customer service. Most small companies are so small that these are the most distinguishing factors of their business and they protect them. Most small companies do all of their business in the light of day. Why? Because we do business with people we know, like, and trust, and to e exhibit those same traits makes us business worthy. Scott Stratton, the author of the book on marketing, makes the statement, to be awesome at customer service, you just have to be average because everyone else sucks at it. I believe he is very correct in that statement, and it goes to my point that having a strong culture and a solid compass are, in fact, a very powerful competitive advantage. Over the next 35 minutes or so, I'm going to present some thoughts and ideas on both culture and compass. I'm going to highlight several very important and influential must-read books. You could even consider them homework. And I will introduce several excellent white papers to help you move your company, culture, and compass along in the right direction. So the most important question I have for you is this. If I can show you that a good, or better yet, great culture and aligned compass can give you not just a competitive advantage, but also a thriving environment for your employees and your clients. Could it be what puts you and your company on track to break out of the box and get to the next level? As always, I know it can. So let's get started. First, let's be clear on what we mean by culture and compass. For culture, there are, of course, several definitions, but for our purposes, we've selected the following. The set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices that characterize an institution or organization. Your culture is usually expressed using the value statement, but it's much more than just the values of the company and top management. You need to know what is your company's culture? How does it manifest itself? Unhappy, disgruntled employees? Super go-getters cheering when you let them in the door on, on Monday morning? What about when you hear an employee or coworker say, well, that's just the way we do things around here. That's part of the culture. It may not be what you want, but it's what you've got. And that statement is most often linked to product quality or service delivery somewhere inside of your company. And if you're asking, how did you get here? Most likely your culture came into existence over time. And even though you may think you had a big influence on it, it's more like a plant that showed up in your garden. Not sure who planted it, not sure that it's bad because it hasn't killed any 
uh, off yet, doesn't resemble anything you intended to plant, well, the good news is, if it's not openly offensive, it might turn into something good if you work with it. Now for the compass. The compass that we're concerned with is any of various non-magnetic devices that indicate direction. There are many compasses referred to in this discussion. The compass of the company strategy that will tell where it's going and if it's on or off course. There is the moral compass of each individual in the company and most important of each of the leaders of the company. Earlier, I used the term fixable compass and broken compass. What I mean is that sometimes the compass you carry around doesn't point true. It gives a bad reading, and if you blindly follow it, you will be lost. Sometimes a compass needs to be calibrated. And believe it or not, some people or companies don't have a compass. No set direction and no way to know if they are on course. You need to know what direction is your company headed. Does everyone know the direction it's going? How do they know? because it was mentioned in, uh, to them in a meeting once, two months ago. If you're the owner or the principal of a company, do all your people share your understanding of the chosen direction? Do they all agree with it? Do they all champion it? What about the moral compass of the leaders of the company as a whole? Do they even have one? Or is it lost or worse yet broken? My final question is this. When some important thing happens in the company and there is a hard choice to be made, Will it be made for profit or for purpose? I have several real life examples for you. The first one is this. An engineer was arriving late at a client office. The client technical contact calls into the service desk at the IT service provider company and was informed that the technician would be there momentarily. As a side note, this engineer is the one who can fix anything. Uh, he gives excellent customer service every single day of his life, but in fact is habitually late for almost everything in his life. When the engineer does show up at the client office, the client technical contact, who also happens to be a C-level executive of the client company, asks the engineer to come into their office. When the engineer stepped in, the client closed the door and proceeded to have a lengthy questioning session with the engineer. They asked why he was late to the scheduled weekly visit and asked for specific details about his timeline leading up to that morning visit. The engineer was embarrassed to have to mention this to his own service manager when he returned to the office, that he had been called into the client office and grilled because of what I can consider a lack of culture at the IT company. The service manager made the very simple statement, well, the client has the right to know why he was late. I don't have anywhere enough time today to get into the details of everything that is actually wrong with this. Suffice to say, no one in the management at the IT company made any comment to the client. No one in the management at the IT company discussed the situation with their own HR in case there were going to be problems with that engineer and how he was treated. No big deal. It was perceived as a non-issue. The second example, a relatively green technician is on the evening help desk. It's after hours. He has to make a critical time-sensitive DNS change for a client. He scours all the resources for passwords and contact information and comes up with the only phone number for the registrant of the domain he calls the number and asks for the registrant by name. Typical small business scenario. The client registered the domain in the husband's name, but the company is run by the wife. She catches the call for her husband at home on the home phone. The owner of the client company spent no less than five minutes berating and cursing at the technician for everything from daring to call their home office to being such a complete idiot not to know the information required without having to call her or her husband. The technician quit that evening after his shift. The only thing he could say was he just wasn't cut out for it. Because the compass this IT company is guided by as a whole or the individual leaders is either missing or broken, management chose to say no nothing at all to the client. Not an email, not a letter, not a phone call, nothing. The exact statement by the service manager was, at the end of the day, you just got to suck it up and do your job. Again, as in the first example, there are so many things wrong and I will likely be engaged in extensive dialogue about these two scenarios. But regardless of poor or broken service process, insufficient training, or anything else you can come up with, the company culture and compass have to create a healthy environment for your people and for your clients. I can also come up with a plenty of real life scenarios where the service provider has completely hung the client out to dry because their culture and their compass are not set. I was once threatened by a service provider who told me that our email inbound filtering could just be shut off. I was making reasonable and civil requests on behalf of my clients in my inquiries about lost data and other issues. 
Well, needless to say, we switched to a well-known and highly reliable provider almost overnight. And by the way, that provider is reflection. But I'm highlighting these particular scenarios because in today's competitive environment, it is more likely that a given service provider will absolutely put their clients in front of their people with no hesitation. Now, I know that the most likely statement I will hear from any IT business owner or even service business owner is this. But if we don't get money from the client, there would be no technician. To this, I simply say, just like a spouse, child, friend, or a pet, if you don't care for and protect them, they will not stay with you. Now for some positive notes on Culture and Compass. One of my clients put his entire company of a little over 20 people through an entire week of getting ready for the new year 2014. They all went to the homeless shelter and worked the kitchen. I think they did it two days in a row. They attended a ropes course as a team building exercise for half a day. And then the annual party at the boss's house with slow roasted beast and more drink than an episode of Game of Thrones. He got up and spoke about each and every one of them. He wanted them to know how much he genuinely appreciated each of them and what he thought of them. And my close friend who was about to have her third child got a surprise from her boss. She put in her request to start maternity leave on January 17th. She works for a small company. She knows how her absence will be noted. Her boss tells her she's actually taking off starting the 10th, seven days early, and he is paying for her extra week off. And he's adding an extra week to the end of her maternity run to be sure that she has a full eight weeks off for the event. Another of my clients has completely replaced everyone in his company in under a year and then doubled in size. Before the big change, he had never had a company holiday party in seven years. He said it never seemed like a group of people who would even want to get together for something like that. He had his first holiday party this year, and it was like a giant family get together. He texts me pictures all the time of his team having lunch or going out for a beer after work and celebrating their great successes. It's a truly positive environment he's built. Here's a question for you. Anyone know how we managed to find the Americas or how any group of people found any large body of land across any sea, any time in history ever? Someone had a vision and they drew a map, although the time, space, and specifics may have been a little off, they shared the big picture with everyone who had a choice in the matter, and some great leader, the captain usually, rallied them to a cause. And if they ever got in trouble or forgot what they were working so hard for or where they were going, the captain reminded them of the prize. In the modern world, a crew is usually selected for the race or the voyage, and they are always handpicked by the captain or his officers. Long before the race, or voyage, a course is plotted and a compass heading selected. Everyone on the crew knows the destination and the purpose. The captain tells them what they are in for ahead of time. Bad weather, long nights, and hard times. And very rarely will a sailor come aboard for a race or a voyage that they are not up for, given an accurate heads up by the skipper. Your company is no different. Hand-picked team members setting out to accomplish something. You have a goal, you set a course and rally to have everyone move toward it. They know what they're in for. Bad coffee, long nights, hard times. When the sailing ship sets out and intends to make way along its course, the crew can find themselves off course because of a storm or just bad helmsmanship. And in a storm, when no one is sure of anything, you find out what your crew is made of. Again, your company is no different. Sometimes they find themselves off course due to unexpected changes or just bad helmsmanship. And again, as in sailing, in a major catastrophe, you find out what your team is made of. The culture that exists in the team or crew directly determines how well adversity and problems are handled when things get rough. You've all seen it in every pirate movie ever made, and you've likely seen it in your own company. How well does the team perform when things are at their worst? Absolutely down and out, ready to fall apart. Do they commit mutiny, do they jump ship, or do they pull together and haul in the lines? And how does your company know they are headed in the right direction? And how do they know when they are off course? The compass and your selected direction for the company are what you refer to that tell you if you're off course. And they are what tell you how to get back on course. But it means nothing if it's not known by everyone and everyone is on board with that direction. Most companies don't pay attention to the culture of their company. They 
see the attitudes and behavior and attribute them to one-off or per individual traits. I guarantee you that is not the case. Culture will exist and grow, good, bad, or indifferent. Most employers don't believe they should bother with a clear direction or compass heading because it's not significant enough for their little company. They believe they will just know if they are off course themselves and make the required corrections when it's time. They don't believe that their little company needs that kind of detail. But it's the crew that needs that detail. They need to know where we're headed. Are we on course? Are we off course? And what do we do to get back on course if we are? Well, your company is bigger than just you and someday, most hope, it will be even bigger still. Culture and compass have to come from the top of your organization. The seeds and the nurturing have to come from the leadership. A good leader is supposed to be able to rally people to a cause, but with a poor culture and a broken compass, those people won't stay long. But if you set up an environment of good culture with a solid compass direction, people will thrive in it. Of course, it has to be defined, nurtured, shared, endeared, tuned, and cared for. I mentioned a minute ago how your company is bigger than just you. The minute you realize this and believe it, it becomes imperative that you get the vision of this big beautiful thing out of your head and onto paper. The minute you do, you can share it with others. They can help you fill in the missing pieces if they're allowed to do so. You can talk about it with others in detail. And best of all, you can pin it up on the wall and point to it every time there is a discussion about where we're going. I promised I would highlight a couple of very important books. This is the first one. The book is called Good to Great by Jim Collins. And the concepts that he brings out are very important and key to small business, even though the majority of his discussion and research is on very large companies. The first thing is he looked at these companies to see why, how, how did they get to where to be so great and so big. And they all exhibited one very unique trait, that they were moving along just okay in the market and uh, their stock and their status and everything. And then one day, they took a giant upward move. And he looked at what it took, what changed in that company, what happened that created what is called the hockey stick effect in their, their launch to, to becoming a great company, not just a good company. And I have nowhere enough time to go through the entire book, it is, in my opinion, a must read for any small business. The key things that he points out are these, that good is the enemy of great. If you settle for mediocrity, you will in fact have mediocrity or less. That you have to focus on first who and then what. It's an awesome term and it's very straightforward. First, get the right people working for your company and then you figure out where it is you wanna go. And when you look for people, he discusses the concept of looking for level five leadership. And we'll expand on that a little bit uh, when I talk about another book in a few minutes. But level five leadership is just that. It is people who absolutely know what they're doing, where they're going, how to rally people to a cause. They know that they don't have to be the smartest person in the room. They know how to work with resources. They have people skills, all of these things. And they master the work that they do in every aspect. They create a culture of discipline and they don't accept less. The other key thing is something Jim Collins refers to as the hedgehog concept. Very simply, he says, let's go figure out what it is you're passionate about, what it is you can actually make some money at, and what you think you can be the absolute best in the world at. Again, I'll mention, although his research is about large companies, I have seen it personally and firsthand through coaching of companies and working with companies uh, as small as two, three, four, five, or 20 people, and up to 50, and, and the, the, the sky is the limit as far as size, that if you have the right people working for you, you can do amazing things. If you have a great environment, good culture and compass that your employees can thrive in, that your clients can thrive in, you can get to great. I must tell you that the next two books I refer to heavily because of how they've transformed my perspective of talent cultivation and retention. The first one is Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us by Daniel H. Pink. Throughout the book, Daniel reveals key elements of what really drive people. Engagement, autonomy, 
mastery, and purpose. When we're talking about engagement, we all know that someone who is interested in their work performs better than someone who's not. Autonomy, people in general, always strive for the ability to be self-guided. Mastery, this is one of the most uh, powerful elements. Everyone who is interested in something and really loves it strives for mastery of that thing. Music, art, technology, they really are all the same. Purpose, this is paramount to having a good culture. Who wants to work somewhere for a long time and have no sense of purpose? Most people I talk to who have read this book love the idea but don't know where to start or they just don't see how it can really work. Daniel does point out you don't want this to be a monetary thing tied to performance. He wants you to take money off the table, rely on the autonomy, mastery, and purpose, get out of the way and let these great people do these great things. Again, first who, then what? Of course, I'm going to tell you you have to start with the culture and the compass. The purpose, it's the key element. A side note, referring back to the compass of a company, one very important item Daniel mentions that cannot be skimmed over, he describes how companies who have purpose goals had happier employees and better overall productivity and lower stress. He discusses how the profit and purpose motive can become unhitched, resulting in, as he puts it, just not good stuff. Further, he shows how those companies who focused on profit goals, even though they met those goals, had higher anxiety, depression, and other negative indicators. When people have a culture they can thrive in and a solid direction, it's been proven they will typically follow their leaders into very deep water. The second book, Execution, by Ram Sharan and Larry Bossidy. Larry Bossidy, by the way, spent more than 30 years rising into executive power at General Electric. The three most important elements required to change the culture of a company, Sharon and Bossidy discuss, are social software, social operating mechanism, and people process. And in the people process department, they break it down to uh, that you want to link your people to the company plan and goals, to develop your people for advancement, to handle the non-performers, to build compensation links between HR and the bottom line. To break it down, Social software is described as an ongoing dialogue that brings realities to the surface, teaches people how to think, and ideally brings issues to closure. Notice that these ideas are the complete opposite of the sink or swim strategy. These ideas cause open dialogue. The social operating mechanisms are described as the processes required to change a business culture. They are the mechanisms that will change the beliefs and behavior of people. The social operating mechanisms can be formal or informal, but they must be designed to cut across boundaries, create information flow, and provide mechanisms for spreading beliefs. The people process is basically your employee selection, review, and cultivation system. Larry and Rom describe in detail the building blocks of a robust people process for a large corporation, but they are very analogous to the small business people process. We need social software for communications and open dialogue in our teams and our business. We need social operating mechanisms to change the culture inside of our teams and our business. We need people processes to cultivate our resources and talents. I do want to take a minute to share my two favorite quotes from the book Execution. The first one is this. People generally don't think themselves into a new way of acting. More often, they act their way into a new way of thinking. We've all seen that. We say, I'm going to go on a diet, I'm going to start doing this thing, I'm going to stop doing that thing. But what really counts, as the saying goes, is where the rubber hits the road. When your foot walks out the door to take that step, you start acting your way into a new way of thinking. When we say we will no longer put up with this thing from our clients or this behavior within our company, we act our way into a new way of thinking. The second quote is this, the culture of a company is the behavior of its leaders. Leaders get the behavior they exhibit and tolerate. You change the culture of the company by changing the behavior of its leaders. You measure the change in culture by measuring the change in the personal behavior of its leaders and the performance of the business. Now that's a mouthful and to summarize it, it's very straightforward in that, as I mentioned, culture and compass have to come from the top. And if you cannot change the people that are running the company, leading the company, and directing the company, you will not change the culture of the company at the ground level, on the floor where the work gets done. Back to our discussion on care and cultivation of our talent. 
If you read both books, you may sense a conflict between what Daniel Pink says in the book Drive and what Larry Bossidy and Ram Charan say in the book Execution as to compensation and results. I'd like to point out that you don't have to have compensation tied to performance or results in any size company, large or small. It can work very simply like this. Your compensation is based on what the value of you as a technician or engineer or whatever your position with the company is based on the market study, your longevity with the company, and a natural progression based on either local or national cost of living increases that are typical for your area. My answer and my solution is very straightforward. I suggest that you have quarterly reviews, annual or too far apart for the type of technology that we're talking about in service delivery for IT and for MSPs and VARs. And in the quarterly review, you don't focus so much on that there are specific goals of number of outputs. What you focus on is the advancement of that individual within the company for the best interest of that individual and the company. And that can usually be broken down into some very simple categories. The first one is about relationships within the company and with the clients. What we care about is, uh, do you have good communications with everybody on your team and in, inside of the company? Do you have good communications with our clients and everybody inside of their company? Do you have good communications with our VARs, our vendors, etc.? The second category would be about what I refer to as the technology skill set that you must have to stay relevant in this industry as an employee for this company based on what we're trying to do. I'll even expand on that um, a little bit more in just a minute. The third category then would be the basics of business that if you're having trouble showing up on work on time, you need to get that corrected. If you're having trouble turning in paperwork, these are just items we put on the list and all of it, the whole quarterly evaluation is about helping you get on the path to move in the right direction to get accomplished things we need to get accomplished for the company. And it is true that it could lead to uh, disciplinary action if you're failing to live up to basically the expectations that we have for you as an employee at this company, knowing that we've got a set culture and a compass and we're all trying to go somewhere. Now back to the part about the technology skill set that an engineer or technician or whatever skill set any employee would need. I believe in a, a tool called the core competency matrix. I wrote a white paper about it. I refer to it in a reference section at, on the last slide, and it works like this. You list all of the core competencies that you need to master to take care of your clients based on the services that you provide. You list all of the core competencies on the matrix that you have to have the people inside your company master to be able to operate the infrastructure of your company. You list your key clients and the key software that you use within your company. Then you list everybody in the company and you set out to fill in the matrix so that you have a primary, secondary, and tertiary for every key competency or core competency that you've listed for running the infrastructure of your own business or taking care of the clients. And if everybody's constantly advancing in their skill set based on what we need them to do for the company or what they need to do for the client company, we're on track. And you would even have in the discussion for the engineer or the technician, what are you interested in? Which categories or core competencies do you want to go advance at? And what you end up with is a core competency matrix that basically indicates who is the number one, two, and three person for every core competency that matters to this company. And that is a huge amount of focus for driving the advancement of the talent within the company. Now, the only problem that's going to come along is if you're a one-man shop or two people or three people, and of course you're going to say, this core competency matrix doesn't make sense or we don't need it and we don't need to do review processes. And to that I say, well, if you think that you're going to get larger than one, two, or three-man shop, if you're going to grow, yes, you do. And one of the keys that's pointed out by Michael Gerber in his book, The E-Myth Revisited, which is in the reference slide at the end of this presentation, and I talk about it extensively in the companion presentation to this one entitled Defining Your Business Identity, is that he says you have to figure out what all of the things that you do in your business so that you can uh, document every one of the processes and pass them off to somebody else so that you can go work on the business instead of in the business. And if you do want to grow beyond one or two people, you still have to have a set of responsibilities to say, well, who's the primary on this? Who's supposed to be the master of this? Who's the, the secondary and who's the tertiary? 
If you do that, you also find that when you do bring on the very next technician, you absolutely know what they need to know to, to help the team, and you know what direction to move them in, and the team gets better because there's focus on us caring about the cultivation of our talent. A major factor in getting your business to the next level is narrowing your target market to focus on the ideal client for your business. Not everyone gets to be your client. You have to align your definition of the box with your company strategy and tolerability for risk. I get into great detail about competitive advantage and competitive risk in the companion presentation defining your business identity. In our box example, the ideal or preferred client is IT dependent, $50,000 annual reoccurring revenue, one server and five workstations. They pay us on time and as agreed. They actively participate in their IT health. They respect and trust our advice, like us and our service, and they do not mistreat our employees. Now this is just our example for the box. You can set these specifics to be whatever would make sense to you for whoever you want your ideal and preferred client to be. Whatever the annual reoccurring revenue that you think is the ideal for a given client or the minimum number of servers or workstations, set this to whatever you want. But I highly recommend that the last three items stay in place, that they respect and trust our advice. That's you being a trusted advisor. They like us and our service. We do business with people we know, like, and trust. And they do not mistreat our employees. We have to take care of our own people. The box and the definition of who our clients are are a natural throttle and filter to the influx of business. I frequently hear business owners going on about how they have 20 new clients to onboard, but no time or staff to do it. Well, raise the bar on your target market and find a nice home for those below the line, assuming you can't get them to sign an MSP agreement of any kind or buy in for even the lowest level package. What will happen is it will significantly increase your cash flow and your annual revenue. The term I use is set them on a corrective path to help them fit in the box. And this is much like what we would do with one of our talented employees who's getting off track. Drop those clients who do not, cannot, or will not fit in the box and make room for those who do. Stop chasing every nickel that rolls down the sidewalk and start grabbing folding money that's being handed to you. Who do you give them to? You give them to the people in the area that you partner with that do accept and care for clients of this type. You give them to the companies that are smaller than you and thrive on this type of business. After all, they certainly couldn't handle the bigger clients you're going after, but they can do great service for these smaller clients very well. Now, if you're still telling me you don't have enough business to even have this problem, please reach out to someone to help you figure out if you're in the wrong area, wrong business, or what exactly is the problem. And if you just don't believe there is enough business out there to be had, please watch the companion presentation defining your business identity. It gets into some good detail on the true business possibilities. The final subject I want to cover before we wrap everything up is on focus. And it may seem like I get a little sidetracked, but this will only take a few minutes and it's important to the discussion. In today's world, we must focus on more than just our little business and the small piece of space we occupy. We need to have some clarity and we need to see the entire landscape in which we navigate. Sometimes seeing the true big picture is not as easy as we think. We believe we're taking it all in, but we're not. And failure to take it all in, all these things that we are part of and all that we affect in life or in business, will mean we are out of balance. The great management master, Peter Drucker, who has written over a dozen books and, and spent more than 60 years working and consulting in various sized businesses all over the world, had a concept about something called the social sector. The idea is that there's the public sector and the private sector, and neither seems to actually take any responsibility or be able to effectively help what would be referred to as this social sector. He foresaw a new type of business that focused on the social sector and providing very needed services and products, and not out just for the profit of the company, however run properly to have a profit. Suffice to say, this means that we move to a type of environment where the government doesn't have to become socialist to help the social sector. We actually have an entire business environment designed to do such. Now to add some more perspective, a gentleman by the name of Daniel Goldman, who wrote the book Emotional Intelligence, just recently released a book called Focus. And he talks about three types of focus that we need to have in business and in life. Inner focus, the culture and climate in the, inside the company, 
Other focus, meaning the competitive landscape that we navigate within, and outer focus on the larger realities that shape the environment that this outfit operates within. His discussion, by the way, touches on the fact that the human mind is capable of understanding many things, but we are not really good at understanding complex systems. And complex systems, such as our entire ecosystem for the Earth and our universe, are really far beyond what most of us can understand. Yet, as he points out, we have everyday people making judgment calls and decisions about how they operate today in, the, in their business, in their lives, and in the world without a true understanding of these complex systems. One of the main points he makes is that we now have a new geologic chronological term to mark the evidence and extent of human activities that have had a significant global impact on the Earth's ecosystems. The term is Anthropocene, and this era is believed to have started right around the Industrial Revolution. The final points are these. Drucker is trying to tell us that the corporate participation in the advancement and protection of the environment and our social systems is not only good, but it's in our future. Goldman is trying to tell us that we cannot ignore the social and economic and ecological aspect of the larger world around us, regardless of the size or location of our business. We may not be able to affect these things on a grand scale, but by caring and being involved in any way, regardless of our political or ecological thinking, it endears us to our community and it allows us to be part of something much bigger than just our own little business. If you are a small company whose business is local, it's even more important that we are coupled to something in the community. And you would be surprised how it can help your marketing and the outward appearance of your company. If your entire business is cloud-based and your market is not just local, then good. Select a program to get involved in that is bigger than just your backyard. I personally guarantee you it will mean a lot to the upcoming generations and talent who will be coming to work for you tomorrow. You must understand and develop all of these focuses and decide what will be your company involvement, concern, stand, and action on each of these focuses, especially the outer focus. The challenge. The size of your ship or your crew does not matter. Think about your perception of your company's culture. I say perception because I doubt it is in reality as you perceive. Formulate a picture of it in your mind and put it on paper. Now do an honest discovery on your company's true existing culture. Don't believe there isn't one in place. There is. Ask your people to describe their view of your company culture one at a time or in a group. Don't send out a questionnaire. Don't judge. Don't steer. And don't pout. Otherwise, you will not get an honest and clear answer. Do the same with your company compass and direction or heading. Ask yourself the hard questions about whether you are on course. Let your employees speak freely and voice their opinion about the direction they see the company taking. Compare what you discover to your internal picture. Now you have a company meeting, preferably a lunch or griller. Set the wheels in motion to change the culture and compass to what you envision. Incorporate them into and let them shape your company's social software, social operating mechanisms, and people processes. Incorporate them into your mission, vision, and values and write them down and post them somewhere. Put it in the employee handbook and get everybody a tattoo. Recap and steps to success. I'm not going to read every bullet item on here. What counts is that when it comes time to implement change, I suggest the following. Whenever I work with a company as a coach, the first thing I tell everyone is, be open and receptive to what comes their way. Be dynamic with the changes that will be happening. Be a champion of what we have committed to in our meetings. I always set your teammates up for success. And above all, everyone has to be able to call anyone on anything. And that includes the boss or everyone. It's not about being an equal in the company. It's about having open dialogue. And this goes back to these people process, the social software, social operating mechanism, autonomy, mastery, purpose, and everything that we do to feed our culture and our compass. In closing, for your culture, the culture you set up can be anything you want it to be. Think Microsoft as a learning company, Apple, Steve Jobs just wanted to put a ding in the universe, Google, Virgin America, or your local dry cleaner. For your compass, it doesn't matter what direction your compass points, so long as you pick a direction and hold your course when a storm hits. What counts is that with a good culture and solid compass, 
you have an environment that is healthy for your employees and that your entire company can thrive in. A set culture and compass makes your company stronger. Once you have a truly homogenous culture that binds everybody together and a solid compass course everyone can clearly see, you have the most important elements of success. Everyone who looks at your company will see it. Your clients, the public, your competitors, the world. More important, potential new clients and potential new employees will see it. Without culture and compass, I believe you're no better than a ship at sea with no one at the helm and nothing to direct you. Culture binds your crew and compass keeps your ship on course. And hopefully, in their own way, they help the world spin on balance in the right direction. So it looks like we really only have one question for this presentation. Are there tools that can help select the right people for your team? And the answer is yes. Besides a really good selection process that starts with specific questions about the job and the roles and responsibility this person needs to fit into, I would highly recommend that you get a DISC profile, which is an assessment in a sense of their internal culture and compass and their work habits. And if you've got a DISC profile for everybody on your team, you can tell a lot about how they are going to interact, how to help manage them the best and help them become the best they can for your team. I've included a link to the DISC profiles online. You can also purchase them through many business coaches and uh, coaching programs. Well, thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoyed the content. Here are the resources I promised you. There are two pages of them. And don't forget to keep an eye out for the companion presentation to this one titled Defining Your Business Identity. Until next time, good luck in all your endeavors.